Welcome to Expert Opinion, the branding business forum where leaders share their views, insights, and experiences from the world of B2B branding. And now, here's your host. Hello, this is Ryan Rikus, and today's show is titled How to Look at Brand Strategy When Preparing a Business for Sale. We have a great guest, Alan Sipos, Managing Director of Keystone Capital Markets. They're a highly focused investment bank that provides sophisticated M&A and financial advisory services to middle market businesses. Alan has over 25 years of experience advising business owners on financing, business valuation, preparing and selling their business for the greatest possible returns. So I've known Alan for over 10 years and always really appreciated his perspective as it relates to the role of brand and brand strategy plays in business success and appealing to strategic buyers. So if you'd like to learn the best practices on those topics, I'm sure you'll find some interesting uh, insights from Alan. So uh, let's get on to things here. Alan, thanks for being a guest on Expert Opinion. My pleasure, Ryan. Happy to be with you. Well, let me start off with a one right down the middle here. Um, I know it's very difficult to put a dollar value on a brand. Uh, there's been a lot of studies uh, trying to do so. But um, from your perspective, as you're evaluating a business and considering the, um, the multiple, the, um, the valuation of it, how do you think about brand as it relates to uh, and when you're advising a business owner and how to sell their business someday? You know, great question, Ryan, and it, it's really the core of a lot of what we do with our clients is, is understanding what drives value and what would be interesting and unique from a buyer's perspective, and brand often plays a major role in that. You know, buyers are typically looking at, at three alternatives when they are buying a company. They can buy the subject company, number one. Number two, they can buy another company, a competitor, if you will, and number three, they can begin a company, start a company on, on its own, from the ground up, if you will. And the more that option two and option three, that is buying another company or starting from the ground up, are unattractive because of the uniqueness that the subject company has, the more that happens, the more valuable the business is going to be. And so brand can play a really important role in that in differentiating the business from competition, adding value, perception of value in the marketplace. And really, at the end of the day, a buyer is buying the level and, and certainty of future cash flows. And so the more the brand differentiates the business, the more it creates this protective moat around the business, the more valuable the company is going to be because the, the certainty of those future cash flows will be higher and more protected. So brand can play a really important element. Now, that, that's the easy part. <laughs> the, the harder part is determining how much value it truly adds. And that's going to be somewhat in the eye of the beholder. For some buyers, they will see brand as very important and a key focus of what they use to value a given target. Others may, may feel that the brand will need to be refreshed or repositioned down the road after they buy the business, and they're less focused on current brand and thinking about where the brand can be developed. And, and that will influence their thinking. But at the end of the day, what's really important to understand is brand is going to be a key determinant of value. It's going to help to differentiate the company in the eyes of customers, clients, and, of course, buyers when the time comes. And paying attention to that from an M&A or a mergers and acquisitions perspective becomes very, very important. Well, I think that's a fantastic and succinct uh, summary. So um, considering that there is additional value uh, in a brand that's well-defined, um, has a competitive advantage um, for all the reasons that you just described, how Early, should a an executive, a owner, a CEO, uh, think about uh, their brand as when they're preparing the company for a potential sale? Well, we like to say in our business that time is your friend. The, the sooner you begin preparing, the better. So we joke that you should begin thinking about a sale the moment you buy the business or the moment you start the business, because eventually you'll exit from the business in one form or another. Uh, you know, hopefully walking out the door with your head held high and a, a nice payday and moving on to the next chapter of your life. And hopefully it's not under duress or stress. So really, the sooner the better. It's extremely important to, to think about all aspects of value, and particularly brand and how it's going to play into value. And uh, as you, I'm sure, well know, Ryan, the development of a brand, the implementation of a branding strategy takes time. And if you're rushed through that process, unfortunately, you often don't get the best results. So the sooner they start, the better, and the more attention they pay 
to it from the outset, the better. Yeah, it completely makes sense. And uh, it absolutely does take time not only to develop the brand um, and change people's perceptions, ultimately. Um, and you have both the internal branding and the external. So the external, of course, is important to uh, appeal to a buyer, but also the the, uh, the internal branding, uh, getting the team aligned around the a, a vision for the future and, and how to position the brand so it's unique and, and then ultimately making a brand promise. But then ultimately the, uh, the internal team has to keep that promise too. So well, do you, um, well, do, as you're well, advising wanted... uh, companies, do you also think about that in the area of uh, internal branding and getting the team aligned? Absolutely. I, I was just going to say, you know, the brand becomes enmeshed with the culture and value proposition of the company. And, you know, there are examples of companies that have a public facing brand, that is not uh, internally accepted by by the staff, and, and that becomes a, a disconnect. And, and it's so important that all the employees of the company are really on board with what the branding means to the customer, the outside world, as well as within the organization. Um, all of that becomes very, very important to making it a cohesive message and, and a message that the, the ultimate customer, customer really accepts and embraces. Very important. Well, um, switching topics a little bit, one of the areas that we've been, uh, a trend that we've seen is working with private equity firms who uh, do roll-up strategies where they'll look at a certain industry and they'll buy one company and then two, three, four, five, ten companies kind of in the same area and then initially just keep the brands independent uh, and then ultimately comes a point where it's time to roll them up into a, a brand strategy going forward, whether that's one brand and uh, one dominant brand, and maybe there's five brands, but one dominant brand or maybe a, 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 a one brand per channel or something like that. So uh, that's an area that we get involved with quite a bit as well is, is um, what we call you know, brand architecture and, and developing a, um, a long-term roll-up strategy. So is that something that you guys get involved with as well? Absolutely. The the strategy of a private equity group of buying an initial company, what's usually called a platform company, and then adding add-ons or new companies to that platform is a, a well-worn and, and time-proven strategy. Most private equity groups will buy companies with the objective of building value and selling the business in five years or less. There are exceptions, but typically it'll be five years or less. And, and back to what I said earlier, value is going to be driven by the, the level and certainty of future cash flow. So a private equity group comes in, they buy the business, they shed excess costs, they streamline operations, maybe they improve their, their uh, uh, supply chain management and uh, make a few other thing, uh, adjustments that, that help to improve cash flows. And lo and behold, suddenly you have a company that's cash flowing at a higher level. So if the, if the private equity group is focused on increasing the level of future cash flows by focusing on the brand in parallel with that, value can be increased as you get to the certainty of future cash flows. In other words, you can do all the things that I just mentioned and the cash flow will increase. But alongside that, if the brand is being built and you're, you're creating this differentiation I mentioned earlier, that's going to help to keep competitors out and better position the, the availability of that cash going forward. Thus, value goes up. Again, back to the fundamentals of the level of future cash flow and the certainty that those future cash flows will be achieved. That will ultimately be core to whatever a private equity group does. That's the beginning of the story. And then as they begin to add in new portfolio companies to the platform, they're going to be looking at each of those companies with a mind to how can we leverage the brand that we've developed within the core business to get into new vertical markets or maybe new geographic markets or different products, different end users all taking advantage of this core brand. And in some instances, they will look at the, the uh, branding that the target company has done and do just the reverse. Gosh, how can this brand allow us to put our products through the acquired company's channel? We, we had a transaction a few years ago that involved a company in the pet food space, and the company was, was very active on social media. They had a, a very strong Facebook presence with lots of followers and really strong customer engagement through Facebook. The acquiring company did not have a good social media presence, and they saw the target as an opportunity to not only gain a new product line in a desired niche of the, the pet food space, but also an opportunity to leverage its social media into the other brands that it developed. And so after the acquisition, that core brand was levered into the Facebook presence that the target had and, and used that as a way to get new customers aware of its product. It worked beautifully and, again, resulted in higher cash flows and more protection of the brand. 
Well, you mentioned uh, private equity, you mentioned strategic buyers, uh, and then there's also financial buyers who are buying an asset um, just for the financial benefit. And um, mm. just thinking out loud here, as a, as, a, as a company thinks about their future uh, and looking at where they can maximize their return, I'm sure that the strategic buyer as well as private equity and the roll-up strategies is, is better than the financial. In other words, the financial might just buy an undervalued asset because they, they have something there, but they haven't done a very good job in branding or, or leveraging. And there is it's a lot of hidden value. So I would imagine that as you're advising customers or clients who are thinking about their business and their brand and for a future sale two, three, four years out, uh, thinking about how they can position the company, develop that brand, develop that compelling value proposition, the competitive differentiation can actually add value to to the business, right? And how to think about that in order to prepare and even identify potential buyers. You could almost position a company uh, in that manner as well. Is that correct? Yeah. You know, you mentioned financial buyers versus private equity. You know, we have seen a lot of, of activity within private equity groups and the values that they're offering on businesses that suggests that in many cases they're operating very much like strategic buyers. So they're they're looking at businesses with a mind towards how can they add value and uh, position the business to ultimately be acquired by a strategic buyer. And the result is that in the marketplace, the valuation that private equity groups are paying are often um, – at or even slightly above the strategic value that buyers are, are coming to the table with. So the split in the marketplace that we have seen historically between strategic versus private equity is less uh, less pronounced. So there still can be a difference, but it's less pronounced. When you contrast a private equity group with a, a purely financial buyer, one that's only acquiring a company for the financial metrics, as you point out, there usually is a fairly significant difference because the the purely financial buyer is not looking at some of the intangibles that you mentioned, like brand and, and, and other elements, but thinking, gosh, where can I cut costs? Where are there underutilized assets, et cetera? So there, there can be different levels of value attributed to the same company based on the lens through which each of these buyers are looking at it. Yeah, makes complete sense. So um, I remember a recent report uh, stating that 84% of the average S&P 500 business value is based upon its intangible assets. And just 40 years ago, that number was 17%. So mm -hmm. clearly, uh, the intangible assets beyond physical have a greater value in today's world. And uh, as you just mentioned, brand is kind of related to the company's future ability to perform. And uh, so brand is part of that uh, intangible assets, but also intellectual property. And, and there are a number of different things that are associated with intangibles. How do you guys look at intangibles as you're putting a, a valuation on a company? Sure. The rubber meets the road when the deal gets done and you see what final valuation is, right? That, that's where a buyer has stepped up to the table and, and monetized its perception of what intangible value is. It's often very difficult to isolate intangible value for, for some of the uh, items that you mentioned, such as brand and IP and so forth. You know, we've seen situations where production capabilities or a technology or a market positioning will differentiate a given uh, uh, company from the competition and lead to a higher valuation as a result. So it, it just really depends on the specific situations at hand where there are are very high value attributable to uh, technology or, or IP. Oftentimes you can value that based on a uh, discounted cash flow model or similar uh, approach to try to estimate what the future cash flow will be associated with that element. But it can be very, very difficult. And as I, I said a moment ago, ultimately it's going to be what a willing buyer will pay a willing seller that will indicate what the value of those intangibles are. And it can be all over the board depending on uh, uh, who, who the buyer is and how things have been positioned. Uh, a real quick story, a few years back, we sold a, a manufacturing business that was in the aerospace sector. And the, uh, the, the, the seller had received an unsolicited offer from a buyer. Uh, and it was a very attractive uh, offer. They thought, gosh, let's just take this and, and go to the closing. And thankfully, their, their attorney recommended that they interview some investment bankers. They, they interviewed us and hired us, and we represented the company. We went out to the marketplace, spoke to a number of different buyers, initially got indications of value that were slightly above what the initial uh, unsolicited offer came back at. And then we went through our process and, and got offers that were quite a bit higher. 
And ultimately, the buyer that put the first offer on the table, and I'll just put some numbers around it so you get a sense for context. The initial offer was $150 million. When we ran our process, we were getting offers in the low 200s. Ultimately, that first buyer that was at the table at 150 came back, and we sold the company to them for $305 million. <laughs> wow. So, there's quite a premium associated with the intangible value that that one buyer saw, but it was not until they had the competition of other buyers at the table that they really stepped up and sharpened their pencil. So sometimes it takes a little coaxing <laughs> to yeah. get buyers to Great. really pay for, for, for intangible value, but it's always there. Yeah, great example, and an, an example of uh, the benefit of your process as well. So, um, well done. Yep. So, another topic here, um, when we build brands, we, we always use um, research to guide uh, decisions, recommendations, not only from our point of view, but also to give comfort to the executives as to they're making the right decision. So, we, we go out to the, to the marketplace, uh, talk to customers, prospective customers, if we can reach them. And we use a lot of that to really understand how the brand or company is perceived and then how to position in the future. Uh, some of that research has also been very valuable when preparing a, a business for sale because it gives data and insight to a prospective buyer as to the uh, validation of either uh, the offering and or the future potential. Uh, do you have any experience like that as well? Yeah, I really do. The you know, the, the key tenet of any business is make the customer happy. And in order to effectively serve the customer, understand their needs, wants, and concerns, it's just vital to really be engaged and understand what they're looking for. And uh, this can be accomplished through a number of means, including the research and engagement that you're talking about. But the more the business is engaged with the customer and the, the greater its understanding of what the customer wants, the more sticky that relationship will be. And then back to the, the same old thing again, the more certain those future cash flows and thus the higher the value of that relationship. Absolutely. Very important Perfect. stuff. All right, cool. So um, another area that uh, is a, a hot topic and that is around culture, but also um, what we call guiding statements of purpose, vision, and mission. And, you know, purpose is why we exist, vision is what we aim to achieve, and mission is how we're going to achieve it. So uh, the benefit of these are primarily internally to align and inspire internal teams. But uh, we've also found that it gives some investors clarity of direction, and uh, everything's really well defined. So the executive team is very clear on what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, things can be measured, and um, and you can understand how how far you're along on that path. Um, give me your perspective of that approach. Yeah, I think um, you know having a clear internal culture that communicates the values and and the the, uh, the the mandate of the company is extremely important. And the more defined that is, back to what you said, the more defined that is and clear that is the more I think values have comfort in what the company's uh, current engagement is and, and, and current uh, strategy is in the marketplace. So that will help get uh, clarity around how that fits in within their strategy if it's a strategic buyer or how it might serve as a platform or tuck in if it's a private equity uh, buyer. So uh, getting a, a clear sense for that, communicating it within the organization in a way that engages employees and other constituents within the organization, very, very important. All of that becomes part of the intangible that makes a, a company A with that more valuable than company B without it. Uh, it becomes very important. So I agree with you. All right, cool. Hey, we're almost out of time. So we just got a couple of final questions here. Um, who should own the brand? The CEO, the, uh, the lead marketing person, sales, someone else? Who yeah. in your perspective should own the brand? In my opinion, Ultimate responsibility for the brand lies with the CEO. However, typically there are a number of, of key people within the organization that influence and may take ownership of the brand, including CMO and you know other marketing uh, officers. Um, at the end of the day, every employee of the company should have an interest in the development and protection of the brand. And back to what you were asking a moment ago about culture and how the the organization communicates that internally, I think that becomes extremely important. But my opinion is uh, the CEO is, is the, the, the owner of the brand and the director and ultimately the person who should be the, the direction or create the direction for the brand and, and own it. Yeah, completely agree. They have to take ownership and, and, and uh, 
also agree with your topic or your comment about uh, everyone in the company needs to be able to deliver that brand promise. So that's why the clarity of communicating what the brand promise is, the, the purpose, vision, mission, allows everybody the uh, the guidance and doesn't require a lot of oversight um, to be able to deliver it. So completely agree with that. All right, so we're almost out of time. Any final thoughts, trends, um, important topics that relates to brand strategy and positioning a, and preparing a company for sale? Well, what I would add in, in closing is, you know, the, the path of, of branding or refreshing a brand um, is extremely important. And a seller is going to latch on to that and, and attribute value to it. Um, and there are numerous examples of products that have been rebranded in a, in a hasty or, or less than optimal manner. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, the outcome can sometimes hurt the brand rather than the original brand that was in place. So, you know, I think in all instances, it's really important for the company to have really good advisors on the branding side, to, to have a uh, a clear strategy for what they want to accomplish and to allow themselves enough time to implement that brand so that it has the greatest opportunity to not only improve the core business and its operations, but also from my perspective to help improve the value of the company when it goes to market. So really important that you have time, a good runway, good advisors, good clarity of what you want to do and treat branding seriously. It's not an afterthought. It's core to value. Great summary, Alan. Really appreciate uh, your time today and being a guest and expert opinion. My pleasure, Ryan. Thank you so much for asking me to join you. Well, that concludes our show today. So if um, you have interest in other topics, please visit brandingbusiness.com. We have many podcasts for you to listen to. Two. Two.